was 11 years old because when I was 11 years old, uh, my parents had split up. I'm half Chinese, half uh, Caucasian, and my mother was from uh, Florida, the Panhandle of Florida. So I was sitting under this oak tree, and I had this vision of being an architect. So um, long story short, I, I did become an architect, uh, not an architect, an interior designer. I have uh, dyslexia, so I switched over to interior design, which was natural for me because um, uh, you know, I, I ended up working with builders and, and developers. And so this is one of the uh, places that I developed, uh, that I designed, won five awards for. This was the first uh, model that I did that I was able to incorporate feng shui principles. So I studied all different schools of feng shui and, um, and I would read everything I could get my hands on about feng shui and it was so funny because I'd read things and I'd say, that's not right, that's not right, and I didn't know how I knew this. So to back up a little bit, um, Whenever I would reunite with my father when I was an adult, and I'd ask him questions about my Chinese heritage, he'd do this, be American, be American. And, and even you who are 100% Chinese, you probably heard that story also. And uh, it was only through digging and digging that I found out why he had that uh, aversion to talking about our family. Um, Let's see. This picture is a picture that I had um, very early on. That's my grandmother in the center there. She escaped to Hong Kong in the 40s, I believe, after my grandfather died, with um, an uncle and an aunt. And um, and then I and I got a letter from her in the 1960s, and uh, of course it was translated for her. And, and, you know, she told me that she really wished that our family would go back to reunite with my father. And if we would do that, she'd come and live with us. And uh, she died before any of that happened. And it wasn't going to happen anyway. And then when I was 16 years old, I get this picture. And you can kind of tell from the background it's a manufactured setting. Well, this picture was my older brother. At 16 years old, I discovered I had an older brother that I did not know before then. And so that was him, and on the back of the, of the picture, and I have that over there on the board, was the uh, message about how he and his wife and his two children only had X amount of, you know, bowls of rice to be able to eat and how they had to work long hours, so they were in China. He was born in 1931. His, his mother died right after he was born, and my father had just come back to the United States. So my father did not even see his first child, his first son, until um, um, Du Young was an adult, so in 1960s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, my father finally met his, his first child. And then uh, this is a, a reunion picture just before my father died in, in 19, uh, the reunions in 1989, my father died in, in 1990. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the fun began. So all those years he would not talk, he would not talk, and um, uh, I wanted to put this picture up because if you haven't seen your uh, totems, these are the totems of all the different names. Here it is again. and. The Louis name in the top hundred names, Chinese names, is number 88, uh, and and it's over in this area. And I, I I have learned to read that, so I could pick that one out, even though I wasn't literate at the time I, I found this picture. Um, so, and, and then here are just some of the ways of transliterating and speaking, as, uh, pronouncing the name. So there's the character for thunder the rain over the field, and um, that was my beginning. So my first trip in, to China was in 1985, and um, we started in Beijing. I was with an interior design group, and so I was so excited. I, I thought, okay, I'm finally going to meet some Louis people. And I asked everywhere, everywhere, 
you know, who, uh, do, or, do you know any Louis? And I didn't know at that time that that's not the way you pronounce the name. And so finally I, um, I showed, showed my guide this, which my father wrote my name on, and, and they said, oh, Lay, you're Lay. And I thought, oh, okay, that kind of explains why I wasn't getting any positive answers. And uh, so that was a beginning for me, realizing, okay, there's lots of dialects, and you know, the tones totally freak me out, but I'm getting used to them. I can, now that I've studied a little bit, I can read and I can uh, write way better than I can speak. So as I began my research, I discovered that my father wasn't the first one to come into the United States. My father, I thought, was a chef. And, and then I later found out that, oh, he actually was a son of a merchant. And, and so that, this is the store on Grant Avenue um, back in the 1800s. So, um, it, I know this is in the 1900s. In the 1800s, it was Fang Song Lung. And in, in 1907, it became Was Song Lung. Um, so, slight name change. But all those years that I had walked the streets of Chinatown and never knew this, it just blew me away. So here's, here's your map of Chinatown from 1885. And, and notice the different colors on the map of the different buildings. So they indicate prostitute houses, gambling houses, prosti white prostitute houses, Chinese prostitute houses. This is a, a wonderful map. I'm, I just found this one with a coating on it just recently. So last year, no, 2016, I made a trip with Friends of Roots. Now, Helen, uh, no, Rita mentioned Friends of Roots with that, um, that uh, village database. That was actually how I found Friends of Roots. I'm a meditator, and so one morning I woke up, I meditated, and I said, okay, I know the name of the village. Uh, now, you know, I've looked and looked and looked for 20 years for this village that I have the name of, but it wasn't until I put Sando, you know, in Google search and found the Friends of Roots database. And uh, so, la uh, two, 16, 2016, I made the trip to China with Friends of Roots. So, you know, China's a big place. I didn't know at the time that most of the people who, from China came from the Toisan area. Mm -hmm. So I was really, you know, I wasn't going to just go there. And so it gets, you know, we get Google Earth closer and closer. And then, uh, so this area is above where, where Rita and, and Helen and, and Dan's area was from. And then, uh, and I really paid attention to the landmarks, and um, and even when I got there, they weren't sure, you know, where uh, if they were going to be able to find my village. But when we physically got there, um, we we found this village, and fortunately, it's right on the main street. In fact, um, the sign was, was uh, right there in front of the street, it was a old rickety sign, and so we found Sandoa Village. So um, some of you may know that Sandoa is, uh, uh, means the three plenties, and in the Buddhist culture it stands for the, um, the Buddha's hand, or citron, the pomegranate, and the peaches. And so, um, so even though I found my father's village, I found my father's village. I still did not find his home. I, that was a dud uh, trial there. But that same year that I was doing the research, and, and my research took me to NARA, the National Archives. I did come to the National Archives here, 
but I had much better luck at the National Ar Archives in, in San Francisco, uh, San, 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 Bruno. San Bruno. San Bruno. And um, of course, you do have to push. You have to be a little pushy with the people there. Uh, you know, they can. They say they're real, real busy and and um, have a lot of demands. But you just have to be a little pushy, which I wasn't until I started all of this stuff. And now I've gotten pushy. But that year, <laughs> that year, I also again I meditated. I had these two words on my mind because I knew there was something in me besides you know that vision when I was 11 years old about wanting to be an architect. And so I I go I. Hear those two words in my head, architect, China. I googled and lo and behold, I find this article and I'm so glad I printed out this article because it's no longer available. This was in 2016 and, um, and it was about Yang Shir Lei, architects um, from the Louis family, the Lei family. Not just any architects. Ar Eight generations. This is the the biggest architectural family I have been able to find. Because remember, I'm a student of architecture and interior design. It's the biggest architectural family I have been able to find. The longest reign of an architectural house. Eight generations, almost uh, 250 years. And who they who was their main client? The eight last Qing Dynasty emperors. So, so I was hooked. And I happened to mention that I was looking for, uh, you know, this family to a friend of mine who is from China, and actually uh, her family is in Guangzhou, and she's with the Confucian Institute in William and Mary. So she goes home on December the 13th of 2017, opens the paper up, and what does she see? This full-page article about Yang Shirley. And I, and I brought the article and, and the pages from that I found on the internet. So I really felt like not only was my, were my ancestors guiding me, but they were enlisting anybody who could help. And I was starting to take Chinese classes at this time, so it took me months, but I translated this article. So I would get the story. And not only did she uh, give me the article, but she also um, gave me some CCTV documentaries. And I've got a handout with some of the documentaries if you're interested in watching those. And some of the research tools also, they're, they're printed on that. So after I came back from the 2016 trip, I had made some connections and um, and so I found uh, uh, someone who could get me a, a Zupu. So that's what's over here. A four volume uh, Zupu, which is similar to a Japu, but there's slight difference in if, you, if you're around genealogy people, they'll tell you what those differences are. I don't really care. Um, but what was so fascinating about it was, and here again, I, you know, little by little, I'm translating and I'm translating, and finally I get to these two pages where it talks about Yang Shir Lei and Lei Fada, the progenitor of Yang Shir Lei. So I knew, okay, these are my people. I'm not getting excited for nothing. These are my people. So I then began doing lots of research from the documentaries, from other things. So you know the Qing Dynasty was the last dynasty in China. This yellow line that's on top of the orange line represents the years that, that the Yang Shirley um, was involved with designing for, for the Qing Dynasty emperor. So here is Lei Fada. Uh, he was born in the south, um, Jiangxi province, and which is north of Guangdong. It, uh, Nanjing is the city that's the closest to his village. And so what had happened was the emperor at the time sent um, ministers down to that area to look for people who could build things because he wanted to, uh, um, the, uh, uh, halls of supreme harmony had been destroyed. 
they wanted to, to uh, rebuild that. And out of those people, Lefada was chosen as the person to be the overseer for the Sup Hall of Supreme Harmony. There were three halls there, uh, the main three halls of the outer courtyard. So this is from the documentary. This is what a, um, a design house of the time would have looked like. I, some people are not as visual as I am, so I thought it would be helpful for you to see some of those visuals. These are actual drawings from Yang Shirley. Um, blueprints, elevations, detailed drawings. They were known for this, and, and when I was in design school, this was absolutely the thing I hated most to do. Scale models. But they were known for the scale models that they created. They built them, so when I was in school, we did them out of uh, foam board and glue and, and you know, color pencils. And, um, but they built them out of uh, like a paper mache, mud where they needed to, and they, they wove iron into the paper mache to make it strong. And so that's why the models became known as the iron models. And they still exist. From the 1800s, these models still exist. They were built so well. Um, so, so there's the Hall of Supreme Harmony and the two main, other two main halls um, where the political business was done, the ministerial business was done. And so these are the buildings that uh, Lei Fada and then his son, Lei Jin Yu, um, were responsible for. When I had been, uh, gone to China in 1985, I, I did not know this history. And yet, I, I, I wept when I was in these places. They, they touched me so much. So here's a close-up of uh, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. And I went on this last trip with my sister, so that's Florence and, and me with a bigger view. The Temple of Heaven, they were also responsible for the buildings at the Temple of Heaven. And imagine all the details. In interior design, my motto was attention to details. And so, and when I look at these buildings, I think the myriad of details that they were responsible for. I'll come back to that one in a moment. So uh, one of the really cool inventions that I found, so you're going to learn a little architecture here. Um, this interlocking bracket, the dugong, uh, my ancestor, Lei Jin Yu, was responsible for standardizing this part right here. And by standardizing it, it speeded up the production of things, and it made the column size uh, exact. And so it made everything go so much faster. And that model still um, exists today. Now you might be familiar with a dugong because you have them in your gateway. Next time you, you go by the gateway, be sure it, and look up at that and know that you have Lei, uh, Yang Shi Lei to, to uh, think about when you look at it. Now the uh, Forbidden City is a huge place. I made a point when I went this last trip to take the half day tour. So, and I wanted to focus on the east side because up on the east corner is um, the uh, Qianlong. So he was one of the very famous uh, emperors. Had a very long reign. It was very prosperous during his reign. And when he was getting ready to retire, he had a beautiful studio and courtyard built, and that was done by um, my ancestors also.
These are just some more of the detailed shots in Forbidden City. And what I love, it, when I had that vision about being a designer, I knew at the time that for me, there was no separation between architecture, interior design, and landscape design. And, and when I was talking to my, um, so I'm in elementary school, right, sixth grade, and I talk, my teacher happened to have had a book about Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright at that time was one of the revolutionary people who thought the same way, that the interior, the architecture, the landscape, all was integral. So I had to put some shots of the outside, the exterior. Yeah. And I could go on forever and ever on the architectural details, but I won't. But I did want to show you some of them. So I was hoping that this was going to be the building I was looking for, but it wasn't. And again, the, the dugongs are just everywhere. Once you realize, you know, what they are, you uh, see them just everywhere. And do you know that dugongs were tested for a 9.5 earthquake? Yeah. And there are no nails in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just amazing to me. So I love this picture because this is a picture of uh, Chiang Long and uh, Giuseppe Castellano. So, you know, he was in the uh, Forbidden City and the Summer Palace about the same time as the Lay family. So they cross paths often. And, and one of the reasons why he became important with the Lay family was he introduced a different way of doing art in China. He integrated the Chinese way of doing art and the Western way of doing art. And, um, and so there's some things when, when he started painting in China that had never been seen before. For instance, uh, the emperor on a horse. That, that was just an unheard of thing before he came along. And he's going to have an interesting role to play in this retirement house also. He also brought a technique called trompe l'oeil. And trompe l'oeil means to fool the eye. It's a, it's an art technique where it's made to look like it's real. And, um, and Qing Long wanted to have this technique used in his uh, retirement studio. So this, this is showing you the, um, the renovated studio. In uh, 2003, they opened the doors to the studio and it was the best preserved uh, place in the Forbidden City. And so they began renovating it. And this is the end result. Unfortunately, I did not get to go into the studio last year. But I was told that next year is the 600th anniversary of the Forbidden City. And all of these will be open. So guess who's going back in 2020? <laughs> but I did get to meet Lei Zhongbao. Through some of the documentaries, I found his name, and uh, so I thought, oh, if there's any chance that I can get to meet him, that would just be wonderful. And th with the help of um, my China roots, so the lead of my China roots, Wei Han Li, is going to be, oh, Wei Han Li, Wei Han Wei, uh, Lu. Li. Li. Lei Wei. Yeah. Li yeah. Wei Han. So he's going to be here next month. And uh, he didn't help me, but uh, Lu Hao um, helped me tremendously. So she did a lot of research before I got to China. She was able to locate Lei Zhang Bao to set up a luncheon meeting with him and, and, of course, provide translation for me because my Chinese is not that good yet. And we had the most wonderful hot pot lunch. If you're ever in Beijing, I highly recommend the hot pot restaurant at um, Sun World Hotel. Absolutely amazing and not expensive at all. Um, so Lei Zhang Bao said to me, you've got to tell the story in America which is why I had no intention of writing it as a story, 
until he said that to me, and I could not say no. So our next stop was uh, Tsinghua University. Um, Lu Hao helped me get in there also. It's not easy to get in universities in China. I'll, I'll forewarn you about that. Not like here. And uh, the hoops I had to jump through to get in this university, oh my god. But, you know, they wanted me to, to go there, so I went. And, um, and uh, so she helped me locate. We found three books about Yang Shi Lei. Uh, thanks to being able to have a scanner on your phone, I scanned everything that I could in the time allotted that I, I had, and so I'm still working on translating those pieces. So my favorite part of what Yang Shirley designed was the Summer Palace, Yuan Ming Yuan. And Lei Jin Yu was responsible for a lot of the designs for the Summer Palace. It, it's a huge place. It's about five times bigger than the Forbidden City, if you can imagine that. The Forbidden City is 155 times bigger than the Buckingham Palace. So you kind of get, you know, they did things on a grand scale. So they did these uh, plot plans of the Summer Palace, and then uh, the iron models again. They would take these iron models to the emperor, and of course during the latter part it was also the Empress Dowager, and they would show them to the emperor and the Empress Dowager to get approval for the plans, because the, they could, the emperor and Empress Dowager could not always read the blueprints, but they could look at these models. And I had a client um, who was in New York, and he got to where he asked for models for everything, too. And I was like, oh my god, something does not feel right about this. So just models of individual buildings. This is a, a, a temple in the Summer Palace. My favorite, oh my yeah. gosh, the, the details of this walkway, every piece of art that's in there um, had to run through the offices of Yang Shirley. But I think about all those people who painted and all those people who built and, and uh, just amazing to me. And it's really in very good condition, you know, when you consider those were built in the 1800s. And of course, Empress Dowager's boat. I love the gardens. Uh, and they, in the plot plans, there's uh, descriptions about exactly what tree is going to be here, and you know what plant is going to be there, and and uh, you know they, there's beautiful stone structures everywhere, and so there's notes okay. about all of those. Have you all been to? these places. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. I need to go Great. back for months to really take it all in. I kept telling my tour guide, um, I need longer time, I need longer time. And, you know, they have a tendency to want to rush you through everything. And I just, again, I, I pushed and I said, um, no, we're doing, you know, longer tours here. So Lei Jin Yu was so honored by Qin Long that he had his, no, Emperor Yang Sheng was so honored by Jin Yu that he had his young son, Hong Li, to do a, a banner for him to mark his 70th uh, birthday. Hong Li is who became Emperor Qin Long. So that, you know, that's an honor. Now the story gets really interesting in the 1800s. So uh, if you know your Chinese history, you know that the, uh, there were two opium wars. And, and the opium war in the 1800s destroyed a lot of Yuan Ming Yuan. However, 
um, my ancestor, Lei Jing Chu, had a feeling. He, he, he felt like something's going to happen, and his studio was in the Summer Palace. So what he did was he carted out the things that were in his studio and hid them in his houses. This is one of those houses in the Haiden district. And because uh, you know, th their family was so renowned, he did the, the Japu, and he also created the cemetery to honor uh, the ancestors before him. Uh, Jing Shu was the fifth generation. So he saved uh, the documents, the iron models, so those iron models that I told you that lasted all those years, he was the one responsible for saving them. So this is what it must have looked like. Um, speaking with, so here was the emperor before Ku Ying, and then there's the empress dowagers behind the screen who were really running the show. And then the sixth generation, uh, Lei Su Qi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, he was advanced to a second degree minister. So the squares on their uh, robes indicate what, uh, what their degree in ministry was. So he advanced to the highest degree, and his son was given the third degree uh, ministry. So they were the last ones to work, and so here's part of the destruction of the, of the uh, Yuan Ming Yuan. The photo below is a digital, digitized, so that's what they're doing now. With all of these drawings, they can take that information and do digitized drawings and recreate it. And um, what was interesting to note about, about this particular building is the animals that are around the fountain uh, Giuseppe Castiglione wanted to put nude statues. <laughs> and, you know, in the Chinese culture, that was a absolutely taboo. So um, they decided to do the Chinese zodiac instead. And at each um, hour, each animal would, would put water out to mark the time. <laughs> Amazing engineering. I would love to know how they did that. So, thankfully, to this man, Zhu Ji Jin, saved the documents again. In the 1930s, he was the head of an architectural society. He was also hired by the ministry. And so, he convinced the ministry when he found, he, he would walk the streets of, of Beijing and he'd listen to the old people. You know, because they, he knew that they'd have the stories. And he kept hearing about these documents that, you know, the Lay family had fallen into hard times, so, so they were trying to sell some of these things, um, you know, to, to be able to survive. And um, so he heard about that. And thanks to him, 20 truckloads, over 2,000 documents, paintings, and iron models were saved and they were taken to the National Library and because they were done, they were taken there, they were saved even during the Cultural Revolution. And so, I'm so grateful. If anybody here is a part of the Jew clan, thank you, thank you, thank you. One of the things that they also found was, were rubbings from the cemeteries and so the rubbings were used to document the oral history and the japu and then they were able also because they had the the Qing dynasty documents they would cross check them and and everything matched i had no idea when i began this journey that this was going to lead me to such an amazing story um, since they were saved they and and in the early 2000s, new interests um, uh, in Yangshir Lei came about. So the National Library pulled out the documents and they created a, um, an exhibit 
I couldn't get into that one. They, it was under construction, so I could not get into that one. That's why I ended up in Tsinghua. Um, they had the few books that I could get access to. The Palace Museum, as the Forbidden City is also called, has a permanent exhibit now about Yang Shirley. They call it the Way of Building, the Art of Architecture. I was able to look at it online. However, remember that shot, I said I'll come back to that. Um, when I got physically got to that space, they would not let me in. It was closed and and even though I told them, look, I'm, an aunt, I'm a descendant, uh, you know, I should have rights. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> but more, yeah. next year when I go, this will be open to the public. And so I'll be able to see up close and personal these beautiful models and drawings and, and just so amazing to me. The National Center of Performing Arts also did a play about Yang Shirley. It first came out, I think, in about 2008, and then last year they redid it uh, for na uh, National Day, the first part of October. I missed that, darn. I didn't get there until the end of October, but hopefully next year they'll do it again. And I was able to find online, and so I had a friend in China uh, locate this book for me, and this is the book that, about Yang Shirley by a scholar, and, and he also got in touch with uh, Lei Zhangbao, and I'm in the process of translating that. And because of that book, I was able to find out that the birth date for Lei Fada was February 20th, and I thought, I was working on the, on the script in January, and I thought I'll never be able to get it done in time, but I got it done with a week to spare, and, um, and so I was able to celebrate uh, his 400th anniversary. And in the, in the, um, the book, uh, Lei Zhang, Zhang Bao Zhang's book, um, is a picture of Lei Fada. Oops, wrong button. So I made, got mine. I have some copies here. They're only three dollars. If anybody wants a copy, would like to read more details. I there's so much I didn't, um, didn't. Uh, share, and my other book is also here. And even though Yang Shirley comes from a small family, every time I think about this story, every time I look at these pictures of all these places that I went, I thought about all those other families who participated in building, who built, who wove the textiles, who who you know, carved the wood carvings, the stones, uh, made the tiles. Um, so I, I have a feeling that your stories are wrapped in, in those. Dojia. It's the first Chinese word I knew, Dojia. Thank you.